Hello, good morning. Welcome everyone. Welcome to this webinar this morning. My name is Lily Geisendorfer. I'm director at Jerwood Arts. Um, for description purposes, I'm a white woman in my late 30s with blonde hair and a big smile. And today I'm wearing a white shirt with funny faces on the collar. For those who don't know us, Jerwood Arts is the leading independent funder dedicated to supporting early career artists, curators and producers to develop and thrive. And today I'm joined by an amazing collection of speakers from three different organisations and my colleague John Opie from Jerwood Arts to talk about random selection. Before I start, I want to do a bit of housekeeping and ask everyone to just turn on their uh, turn off their mute buttons and, and say good morning um, to you all. So yeah, can we get a, a warm hello to the crowd? Morning. Hello. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. Hello. Welcome all. Um, and special welcome to our BSL interpreters, Jenny and Sandy. Thank you so much for being with us. This event is being audio uh, auto transcribed. So if you want to turn that on, you should be able to see a small CC sign in the bottom of your Zoom menu. If you don't see that, it might be that there is um, three extra dots where you can click on and see an option to show subtitles. The event is being recorded as well. So you can see that red pulsing light and that's so that we can make it available for those who can't be here live on our YouTube channel. We're going to have a bit of a Q&A towards the end of the session um, and you can use the Q&A function and we'll come back and ask as many of those questions and see if we can answer them um, as possible. So to get us started, a little bit about what we're going to do today. This event is about random selection and how it might be a useful tool in the arts. We trialled random selection at Jerwood Arts last autumn with something called the One to One Fund for which we're publishing the evaluation today. It's on our website as of now. The One to One Fund offered awards of just £2,000 for two artists, curators or producers to connect, experiment, learn from each other and share their ideas. It was very much a response to the isolating impact of COVID-19 and it was designed to offer an injection of support, strengthen existing collaborations or explore new ones. Our brilliant speakers have all recently had experience with trying random selection in their own programmes. They're all very different in size, in scale and in offer. And we've invited them to take part today to share a range of perspectives and practical insights into how random selection can be used as a tool in the arts. So I'm going to spend, I'm going to ask them first of all to spend a few minutes outlining their experiences and then we'll take about half an hour to have a conversation and dig into what actually happened, what went well and what was challenging. I'll aim to guide the conversation to how they, to cover how they managed equity and equality within the process, questions about what happens to ideas about quality or excellence as well as what kind of feedback they've had from those on the receiving end of being randomly selected. And then we'll have about 15 minutes for questions from all of you before I ask the panel to sum up their thoughts. So to kick off, I'm going to introduce our speakers uh, one by one uh, and then ask them to say a bit about their project. First of all, Ash Beaumont and Laura from The Uncultured. Laura Sweeney and Ashley Bowman are arts independent, independent arts consultants working collaboratively to produce, curate, facilitate and advocate. They put artists and arts worker development at the core of their practice, believing sustainability is in crisis and must be addressed by everyone in the sector. They are champions for better working practices and support others to speak up too. So can I ask you to un unmute and tell us a little bit about how you used randomness? Thank you. 
Hi everyone, um, for audio description, so I'm uh, Laura Sweeney, pronoun she, her from the uncultured. Um, I'm a cis white woman in her mid thirties and have shoulder length pale pink hair and a short fringe, um, large gold framed glasses, and I'm wearing a white top. Uh, and my background is a white wall with some artwork. Thanks, and I'm Ashley Beaumont, she, her from the uncultured. Uh, I'm a cis white woman in her mid thirties. I have long orangey peachy hair and a fringe and pale glasses and I'm wearing a black top and my background is yellow. Um, so yes, random selection. We are freelance producers uh, working in live art and performance. And during the pandemic, we were feeling like there was a big expectation for us to suddenly adapt our entire practice to producing film or podcasts or books or anything and everything that sort of isn't performance based. Um, then in 2020, we got some funding from Arts Council England for a project that was called Producing for the End of the World. Um, and this was to look at this dilemma. And as part of that, we created some bursaries that were called shits hit the fan bursaries um, of 600 pounds for two early career producers and also for two mid-career and uh, mid-career to established producers so the early career recipients had the choice of some mentoring with us as well um, but didn't have to receive that if that wasn't right for them so it, it was at a time like not that long after SEISS and the ACE Emergency Response Fund, where basically people were like being rejected from receiving this money that would keep them afloat and alive for like a minute. Um, these decisions all felt really personal and not about art, but about the person and the people. Um, and as our bursaries were kind of no strings attached cash, we didn't think it was our place to be making judgments on applicants. Um, but also we felt like, who, who are we to be doing that anyway? Um, so we'd seen a, quite a few kind of sex worker and community mutual aid groups using lottery systems to give out money. Um, so we thought we would try it too, as it seemed like the most logical approach for the opportunity and the time that it was out so we we just asked people to send a link or a cv um most people sent a cv uh, but for some it was literally just like a link or an attachment without even a hello or all best on the email um and that was quite exciting because they had as much chance as the people who sent like fuller information and niceties sorry there's some screaming of children in the background now um we asked for this so that we could check the only eligibility criteria that we had, which is that they they should be producers of the art forms that we specified. Um, so yeah, the bursaries were 600 pounds and each, and as people who write a lot of funding applications, um, we think that no one should ever be doing more than sending a link or a CV for like such a small pot of money. Um, so it was a reasonably low, input level from the applicant but also from us because we then didn't we, we couldn't offer feedback on something that was like so personal so for us like bursaries by nature are like generally more about the person than a project um and especially when everyone was struggling we felt that using a random number generator would give us like the fairest result um so we had 56 applications for the early career producer call out and 21 for the mid-career and established live art producer call four bursaries were awarded overall um so like the live art producing pool is a lot smaller than that of artists anyway um but we invited applications and reached out to diversity focused groups to encourage a balanced weighting of applicants um this helped us to reach new people that otherwise we we didn't know didn't have any connection with and the generator was our ally on the day and <laughs> didn't select for cis white able-bodied men. <laughs> um, so we think it was a successful process um, for us and for the applicants overall. Thank you so, so much. Uh, lots to dive into there, but I'm not going to go in with questions quite yet. Instead, I'm going to introduce 
um, Jody from the Horizon. Jody Noble is programme producer for Horizon, a performing arts showcase for England at the Edinburgh Festivals funded by Arts Council England. Horizon uses a new approach to build deep and sustainable collaborations, celebrating visionary artists and cultural leaders with a view to significantly rejuvenate the existing ecology of the live performance sectors across the UK. Horizon will be in Edinburgh for one week during August 2022 and 23, featuring live tour-ready performance works and digital wraparound activities. So Jodie, how did you use randomness? Hello, hi, um, I'm Jodie, so my pronouns are she, her, and I am a white woman in my early 40s. I've got brown hair that's around shoulder length and half pinned up, and I've got big brown framed glasses. Um, so yeah, Horizon, um, I should probably start so by caveating to say we're right in the middle of this process. We have done the selection, but we haven't delivered the whole project. So we haven't quite got to the end of um, kind of really being able to see how it's all gone. Um, but Horizon has various open call um, application opportunities, um, some of which do have quite an in-depth kind of application selection process. So we used um, random selection for our artists for a bursary program, which is really an opportunity for um, early career artists or creative producers to come to Edinburgh um, in August with us to experience a, the Horizon program, and then to also participate in a um, bespoke um, workshop program, and also kind of with opportunities for networking and socializing amongst themselves as a cohort, but with the rest of the Horizon artists as well. Um, the offer was a fee, a uh, kind of around um, six hundred pounds, just slightly less than six hundred pounds, plus um, expenses, so accommodation, travel, a per diem um, for the week, plus any access costs. So, as Ash and Laura are saying, kind of kind of quite low level in terms of the funding available. Um, we um, the opportunity was specifically for early career artists, so with less than ten years um, experience working in live performance but also um, an English England based um, artist, but also specifically for um, artists that either identified as being deaf, um, disabled, neurodivergent, or living with a long-term or energy limiting health condition, or also for artists that, um, identified as being working class. Um, so we had a very short application process. So it was really a self um, tick kind of eligibility boxes. Um, contact details and all we asked for was a very short couple of hundred word statement about why they wanted to participate um, and a CV. Um, so essentially we did after we got the closing date we got 66 around 6670 applications in total. We did an eligibility check on the the applications that had come in just to double check that they, they did meet the criteria that we'd set um, in terms of kind of being early career etc and based in England. Um, and we, uh, once they were eligible, um, if there was any questions, we just went back to people and kind of gave them the opportunity to, you know, let us know that, um, that they were or that we'd misread their application. And we created two lists, one for, we had eight opportunities in total. So four opportunities for working class artists and four opportunities for disabled artists. So we took the application uh, reference numbers, created two lists, um, if the, uh, applicants had identified as both disabled and working class they went into both lists so and we put both lists through a random generator so the top four um in the in those lists were selected we also put another layer um in there that we you know as horizon we wanted to, we want to support artists that are spread across england um and we do know that a high proportion of our applicants do tend to come from london so we'd reserved four spaces for artists that are based outside london so there was another process in that that if kind of after the first two were selected um we would then kind of make spaces for non-london based artists which we actually didn't have to do in the end but that was part of the process and um and explained right at the start um so yeah we've selected our eight artists and um they are coming to Edinburgh with us in, uh, in August and it's really exciting. And uh, we've had managed to have some openness with the, the offer as well. So we've been able to be responsive in terms of our workshop program um, to what, to you know, who was selected rather than that being kind of um, prescribed in advance. Thank you so much, Jodie. 
yeah, as you say, yours is very much happening now. <laughs> so yeah, lots of live learning to share. Um, next up, I'm going to introduce David Byrne from New Diorama Theatre. Um, so David is Artistic Director and CEO of New Diorama Theatre in London. In 2011, he founded a completely new type of theatre, a company's theatre. Five years later, the theatre launched its artist development programme, a wide ranging raft of initiatives that subsequently nurtured dozens of companies, hundreds of creatives. In 2018, it overhauled its programming model, putting unprecedented confidence in emerging ensembles. Most recently, New Diorama opened its revolutionary space at Broadgate in partnership with British Land and the City of London's new Culture and Commerce Task Force. The initiative was supported by Arts Council England and Gerard Arts, amongst others. And I think the example you're going to use is about NDT Broadgate. Um, David, welcome. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name's David. I'm a white male with uh, scruffy dark hair and very large eyebrows, which I probably should have sorted out by now, but I'm going with them um, against a very uh, a light uh, bedroom background. Um, so yes, um, as uh, Lily said, um, just after the second lockdown, New Diorama um, opened NDT Broadgate, uh, which uh, for the year um, of the project was one of the largest rehearsal complexes in London, 20,000 square feet, 29 uh, really high quality rehearsal rooms, design studios and communal areas given out completely free to freelance and independent artists. Um, it was quite a long conversation that got us to deciding to assign by lottery. Um, as an organisation that does a lot of artist development and a lot of artist opportunities, we really try and find the form of the application process from, I suppose, the, the sort of gesture and emotion of the, of the um, offer, but also from the context. And um, I think it really challenged with what uh, Laura was saying earlier, that during that time, there was so much rejection. Um, there was so much of people um, having to put themselves sort of emotionally on the line to sort of get support and, and, and to secure survival that we thought actually we don't want to create something that's going to attract sort of thousands and thousands of applications that is going to require people to sort of bleed onto the page just for some free space and some free resource. Um, so we devised a, a sort of system through which people could apply um, and we would randomly select um, those um, uh, artists uh, who would come and use the space. Um, there were several challenges around this. Um, first of all, it was about simplifying the offer down and distilling it down to make sure that what we were offering was identical across every single space and across every opportunity. Um, because otherwise the lottery system would sort of fall apart. For example, if some rooms had dance floors, some rooms had PA systems, some rooms were accessible, some rooms weren't, all of a sudden the sort of like for like random selection would no longer, would no longer hold. Um, we wanted to make sure it went to freelance artists, um, so we put in a caveat that we were not going to be accepting um, applications from national portfolio organisations. Many of them still applied, um, but it was, uh, it was sort of clear. Um, and we wanted to make sure that people had a reasonable approach to fair pay, to make sure that the spaces weren't used to sort of further worsen uh, the sort of working situations um, for, uh, for independent and freelance artists. We wanted to make sure that the space was used by artists who previously um, were lacking in sort of opportunities and representation across the sector, but also are from groups where people wouldn't automatically um, necessarily have access to this source of resource. So we reserved more than half of the space um, for work being led by Black, East Asian, South Asian um, and global majority artists. Um, we um, included in that um, working class uh, led work and uh, disabled and uh, deaf led projects. So once you applied, uh, we created a very simple portal. The idea was you could complete it on a bus sort of very quickly. Um, a lot of it was, uh, was um, uh, multiple choice. So it wasn't about worrying about giving the right or wrong answers, just giving us the information that we need needed. The first uh, lottery that we did was for all of those artists who uh, were applying for that reserved space and were eligible for that half that we had put aside for um, and ring fenced for artists um, from those backgrounds. Um, that lottery system was done by random selection through Excel um, sort of first, and we would just keep going and allocating space until we could allocate space no more. And if in that round, um, 
it satisfied um, all of those applications, we'd move on to uh, the general uh, selection. If there were applications left that we hadn't been able to provide a ring fence or reserved space for, those applications would then be taken and put into the um, put into the sort of second round of selection. So those artists got sort of two bites at the apple. Um, and then on the general selection, we would go through and we would continue um, continue allocating space until there was no longer any any space available. Um, over the project, we had uh, thousands of successful um, applicants uh, who came through and a relatively relatively high um, success rate. Um, but I'm sure we'll get into other things later, but that's more or less in, in sort of fundamentals how that lottery system worked and functioned. Thank you so much for that outline, David. Yeah, a very different project, again, running over a whole year, presumably also learning and improving once you got it started as, as you went along. So looking forward to hearing more about that. Last but not least, um, I'd lo love to introduce John Opie, Deputy Director at Jerwood Arts. John leads on grant making for us and operations and has worked on funding opportunities like the Live Work Fund, this one-to-one -one fund and our Developing Artists Fund. He's also a trustee of Cardboard Citizens Theatre Company. So John, what did we do? What did we do? Yes, good question. Um, hi everyone, I'm John. Um, I'm a cis white male in his late 30s. Had to think there. Um, I've got glasses and not a lot of hair on top. Um, and I've got cream background with uh, a couple of plants. So um, as Lily mentioned at the top of this session, Gerald Arts used a random selection in our one-to-one -one fund last October. The £2,000 awards on offer were to support two people to collaborate together to exchange skills and ideas and begin new research. Gerald Arts over the last few years had become known for rigorous subjectively led selection processes, including positive action throughout. Um, like David said just now, we asked a lot of applicants in, in going for these, um, these opportunities. We, we asked them to submit full proposals for their project ideas. And on the flip side, for us, it takes a lot to review and decide on which applications to take forward. Um, I think the, the labor on both sides of the coin, but especially for, for artists, um, was really clear. Um, so in a previous more open call for entries, the Live Work Fund, we got 1,283 applications and made just 33 awards. The choice of trying random selection was to try to make it easier for people to apply for funding and more straightforward and transparent in the decision making uh, of them. So um, the one-to-one -one fund really came about through trying to find an alternative um, method of um, decision making that was, was that kind of fair and transparent approach. Uh, it was important to get the call for entries right, ensuring that the opportunity was communicated beyond our immediate networks. Um, uh, we we recognised there was a risk that the um, artists we knew and loved and had worked with before would hear about it first, and that was fine. Um, but we also wanted to go beyond those networks, so we put a lot of effort into marketing the opportunity. Um, through extended networks. Um, we contacted all sorts of organizations and artist networks to um, get the opportunity out there. Um, the breadth of applications was really important to, uh, to become as wide as possible to give the final outcome the best chance of being diverse. The outcome of random selection is only good as the pool it is drawing upon. I think a mark of success of um, this for us was that 81% of applicants applying um, to the one to one fund were applying to Gerald Arts for the first time. The response was also um, large. Um, we got 80, uh, eight, 856 pairs applying. 
we asked um, the pairs to, in the application, um, to just tick boxes confirming eligibility and to provide links to their websites or social media and give a short statement of what they wanted to do with the award. Um, as you can imagine, with 856 pairs, the response still generated a large amount of material to review. We had a bit of quandary about whether to eligibility check before or after draw. We decided to do it after, but with hindsight, before would have been better because we were in the bind of not funding a handful of those drawn because they were ineligible. Um, we not in in running the one to one fund. We not only use a random selection. We also use um, we we built in a few more um, improvements to our funding offer. Uh, for example, we use a new self defined approach to determining whether an artist was early career. And also the fund's focus on supporting pairs or collaborators was an innovation for us, asking people to apply as two equals. Um, there were a lot of, so this, this meant there were a lot of changes from one fund and it made it more difficult to manage and understand what changes we had made and what, um, what effects that had produced. Um, we wrote a blog about this on our, which is published on, on our website. We um, set that out to the end of last year. Ultimately, though, we funded 42 pairs of artists, most of whom we did not know before the one-to-one -one fund. And the range of work and ideas that um, we've seen coming back over the last six months or so has been really inspiring. It shows that if you take a risk with funding, you can be hugely rewarded. Thank you very much, John, for setting that all out. Um, so I'd like to start by noticing a few things that all these projects have in common, and that's all of you touching on a much simpler form, asking a lot for a lot less information up front, and that that was a real reaction to, in some ways, the pressures of the pandemic um, making fundraisers of every independent art out there uh, trying to just survive. Um, what, what were the pros and cons of that much less information tick box application form in terms of, yeah, how did, did it give you what you needed and how did that eligibility checking um, John just mentioned uh, was quite, quite challenging? Um, can anyone tell, a bit, tell me a bit more about um, yeah, that simpler form, is that something, yeah, what did you learn about simplicity in asking for information and, and eligibility? I'm going to pick on Jody, I think. Um, I think that having a really simple form was, it was great for us because as other people touched on one of the reasons we wanted to do the random selection was to genuinely decrease form filling labor and and to not prioritize people because they were good at filling in forms essentially and um for horizon you know we have tried to simplify our other programs but there is a certain amount of information that we need for, for those to, to get from those so we haven't they are a more intensive kind of process of application so that was really important for us and really exciting that we can offer that um, in terms of eligibility, I think that the it it was really I think it's it was something to bear in mind is just being really clear on what your eligibility is and how you're going to check that if you're going to, um, and that was something that came up for us a little bit, particularly around um, we'd said early career as being up to ten years um, of practice. So I think that was the most tricky bit I think to just check people's eligibility from that point of view particularly because we'd ask for CVs and often people may put kind of student work that they did on their CVs and things like that so without kind of being too intrusive into people's CVs to kind of work that out so I think that would be something I'd say is to be really clear on what that eligibility is and how you're how you're going to check that and what the methods would be around that but in terms of that simplicity I think um 
I think it's felt really refreshing. And I think that, as I say, we're in the middle of it, so I'm not, I can't really get to the end of how, what that sort of meant overall, but, um, but it certainly hasn't been tricky in terms of our process. And as we've, as it's been in our power to adapt, um, as I was saying earlier, adapt to kind of what the offer is to some degree based on who was selected, um, that that's, that's made that kind of less important to have huge amounts of detail mm -hmm. from people at an early stage. Yeah, just asking for absolutely what you what you need um, and slimming it right down. Um, Ash and Laura, how did eligibility work for you? And your because you also just asked for a CV or a link. You went absolutely minimalist. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, again, that like part of that was that we there's nothing really else anyone could say. We just really wanted to check eligibility. Um, so with that I mean again because it was a because it was a bursary and a bursary is meant to be no strings attached I've never really been able to work out how a panel could can judge a bursary just mm. again it's like whoever asks most nicely there's not I'm not really sure how that has ever worked but that's why I'm not on panels but um but we re but what we thought would happen truthfully is that we thought okay well this works really well for for us as well as the applicant because we thought well for the applicant it's just something they've already got so they can send that and there's no there's no added time um or labor and for us there'll be no feedback needed after the draw um but we definitely actually spent quite a long time checking everybody's eligibility we we did check eligibility before we did the um number generator so that we could tell people um if if and if and why we didn't feel that their practice um sat within being a a, a live art producer or a performance producer um so that all, but typically it was just that we would ask a question and there'd be a bit of back and forth so there was quite a lot more um sort of questioning and going into that than than maybe we'd anticipated um so, I mean, I think what we learn is that for the future, that more time is needed, as, as Jodie was saying, really to craft the call out to make that eligibility really, really clear. But also some of that is in the flexibility of terms, you know, like what is live art? And we started, you know, sending people videos from Lada of Joshua Sofa. And, you know, it, it got quite far down a, a road of um, of sort of trying to have a discussion about what is live art. Um, which wasn't necessarily anticipated for a, a call out, but it was sort of where it needed to go. Um, what do you think, Laura? Was it kind of, like, it was kind of the, the energy and the expectation felt quite balanced, I think, for what we had, so. Yeah, there, there wasn't so much pressure on us as for the applicants, but I think definitely we spent a lot more time up front and double checking than we would have if people were just applying and then we had to sit there and spend the labor at the other end so it maybe it was a bit less labor on our end but yeah. probably not that much um but also our application pool was quite small so for the scale of opportunity i think honing that eligibility was obviously easier because it was going to hit less people mm -hmm. um because already like the producing pool is small the live art or performance pool is kind of small when you get in there and then early career and more experience so it's tapering off in numbers for us anyway so it was definitely more manageable yeah John do you want to add any more to the yeah how to use criteria clearly simply yeah so um general darts criteria cross board is around supporting early career um, artists, curators and producers. We support people based in the UK, um, committed to working and uh, making of the practices in the UK um, and not in education. Um, there's also certain um, commercial art cultural practices that we can't support as well uh, or don't choose to support as well. All of those things are very subjective when it comes to the, the um, complexity of how um, creative people and artists and producers um, build their careers. So I think we, we have always um, uh, found checking eligibility quite a difficult task to do as applicants find it difficult to understand 
eligibility as well as it applies to their own personal circumstances. And normally we have a, a project application alongside the um, eligibility. So we've got a lot more to look at in terms of both assessing whether it's um, a project we can take forward and process according to those kind of um, the funds criteria, but also checking eligibility alongside. What one, one fund did was strip it all the way back to just eligibility. So those kind of complexities about whether someone is eligible or not, and the, the huge gray areas around what is early career, what is a, a practice that we as a funder can support, are they sufficiently based in the UK to be supported by us? It, it really hones down the kind of scrutiny onto those things in quite an uncomfortable way. And what we found is that we had asked people to tick in a high trust way. I, I'm early career, I'm based in the UK. Um, uh, my practice is predominantly one of X, Y, Z. So we took that high trust approach. And then when we got to eligibility checking, we were in the uncomfortable position of having not asked for CVs, de delving into people's websites and trying to determine whether what they declared on the form was actually, um, you know, met the, the spirit and what we're trying to do with the, the funding. And that created a very uncomfortable kind of several moments of going, oh, hang on, wow. it's just an ethical thing to be doing. Have we asked for enough information? Um, and yeah, it, it, it was difficult. I, I think we got there in the end, but it certainly raised a lot of very challenging questions around our, our kind of um, definitions of what these things are. Um, and, and it put in sharp relief without the kind of project information to look at alongside it. Yeah, thank you. I remember it well. Um, I'm going to move us on to another really interesting area of the using randomness, um, which some of you uh, did a lot of work to balance for equity within your processes. So prioritizing and specifically targeting and running lists through the random generator to support DDEF and disabled artists or neurodiverse artists, working class artists, black South Asian, North Asian global majority artists in different ways. And I'm really interested in that because of course, the random element is about every application having a, a, an equal chance. It's an equal fair, approach rather than putting equity at the heart of the selection process which is what most selection panels and processes seek to do a much more subjective and qualitative and um, careful looking at equity um, across the the balance of a decision making process but I'm really in, I'm impressed that in so many cases you you managed to basically do both uh, to ensure both a kind of an e a, a fairness in that selection, but also um, a much more equitable uh, prioritization of those who are under su supported. Um, and yeah, I'd love to hear a bit more about what challenges and um, that threw up and also what response that got from, from applicants. Um, David. Yes. Um, I mean, it was really essential to us that the project tried to begin to address some of the sort of deeper structural inequalities that the pandemic threw up. Um, and I, I suppose sort of echoing from the last, the last question, I mean, getting and distilling down to a level of simplicity where it felt like this was a really clear to understand process and we weren't asking a huge amount of information of people, but we could, we could um, ensure a certain level of um, of equality and inclusion in that project um, was really challenging. It took us quite a few goes to get it right um, before we before we launched. As I sort of mentioned, we um, reserved more than half of the space um, at NDT Broadgate uh, for artists that fell into those categories. Um, well, actually, I mean, to go more into the weeds, because we're not going to talk about us for a moment, um, work that was being led by those artists. 
Um, so that was a big uh, thing that came up in our in our discussions around, you know, with groups and when we were trialing sort of ideas and trialing the application process is people didn't really understand or had very different interpretations of, you know, work that involved those artists or included them in some sort of way. And we felt that actually that was quite open to a broad interpretation that may sort of undermine uh, the sort of ambition of, of what we were trying to do with that reserve space. So we were very clear that it had to be work being led by those artists, um, where they were sort of in the driving seat and, and, and sort of the, the, I suppose, the artistic leads or the instigators of those projects. Um, it increased quite considerably the um, the sort of overall diversity of people who were who were applying, and I think the the sort of invitation and the language we took pains to sort of get right. The fact that we said like it was reserved space, so it was it was space that was was, was sort of there to be to be sort of claimed, rather than making it feel like it was somehow a, a sort of numbers exercise, or we were um, it was just the same old language uh, sort of around it. And I think the process sort of gave people greater confidence that they would have a greater chance of sort of cur securing the resource um, through the system we had we had set up. So it did increase the um, diversity of the applicants um, to different numbers in different categories, but there were, there were sort of differentiations uh, between uh, the groups that we were that we were particularly um, interested to provide space for. Um, so yeah, there was there was some sort of great learning around that, and actually that process that process worked quite well, especially with those artists getting uh, sort of multiple opportunities to get to get space. So actually, we ended up sort of um, putting a lot of those who were unsuccessful through that first uh, ballot into a second ballot where they then secured space. So actually what it meant is the sort of general inclusion sort of watermark over the project sort of sort of rose um, and, and was successful in, in, in that term. Um, as we sort of spoke about the other day, what was very interesting is that what we then had because of COVID and disruption, we had people, uh, we had people um, dropping out of space and uh, leaving gaps, which we then opened up a sort of last minute chance to access that space. And actually the diversity and inclusion statistics on that last minute space were even higher than through the lottery. We're still trying to sort of work out why and we're still sort of investigating into that. And it sort of flew in the face, I think, of everything that we had sort of assumed as an organization that you would need like a greater lead in time, you would need greater signposting, um, that you you needed something that felt like there was there was a system that was sort of stacked in favour of, of those who who previously the industry has been stacked sort of in favour against, um, but it's been a really big learning curve in terms of in terms of how we how we how we do that. But it was a really essential part of that entire project to make sure that 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 reserve space was there. And on the whole, it's it's led to some great introductions and to some partners who we probably would never have come across before, but who are now working with relatively closely on a whole host of projects the sort of organizationally letting go of that control ever so slightly has led to some has led to some really unexpected outcomes and building that inclusion into that randomization system was the real key to get to the point where we're at now yeah that unexpected outcomes and discovering new new artists um was really key driver for us to try it as well um we did a lot of research in in science funding in fact where randomization is used to um, select projects, experiments, essentially to try and discover new breakthroughs. And they absolutely rely on randomness to counter bias in order to make sure that they do find the next breakthrough. Because without that, they, they know they'll just be stuck in the same groove. And I, I, th I remember us thinking that, well, in terms of enabling and discovering talent and potential and artists that are just flying under the radar surely that's that that uh, science analogy works in the arts as well and in, indeed i think the evaluation we published in the activities and up at the artists are funded by the one-to-one -one fund have got up to really prove that it was re the new new artists coming through was was possibly the most exciting thing uh, about it um but David, you, you touch on that loosening of control um, as an organisation. And I, I think that brings me on to the last thing I, I think is a really knotty subject when you think about random selection and essentially yet yeah, giving up some of that curatorial uh, control over who you're going to work with. Um, one of the things we got asked a lot was, you know, but how will you ensure the quality? And these words, quality, 
excellence that are bandied around uh, potential talent. I just used them. Um, what, yeah, what did you, what were the thinking processes and how did, how are you thinking about that now? Um, and how did, yeah, how did that kind of go? Um, I'll come back to you, David, first, if I can, but I'd love to get around everyone um, before we go to the Q&A. This was the biggest challenge, I think, for me as an artistic director, but also the question we kept coming back to is what if the quality of the work is low? And obviously they're being supported by us as an organisation. And, you know, this is not just, I mean, you know, as an organisation, we support, you know, tens of artists, you know, companies a year, and we've supported, you know, 700, 800 projects this year. And, you know, what if that work is, say, politically or values wise not aligned with us? What if it is just terrible, you know, and it goes out uh, with our name on it? And, and fundamentally, we did just have to release ourselves of going, well, actually, the sheer scale that we're looking at and the process of this means that we do have to let go slightly. Um, we created a sort of sub brand um, for the organization. So those um, those companies who came through NDT Broadgate, there is special like NDT Broadgate sort of kite mark and, and sort of logos that they can put on their work. So it feels somehow separate to the work that we're commissioning at New Diorama and there, there, is, a, there is a differentiation between the two. But it really was the biggest challenge of all of a sudden, you know, opening what we have cultivated as like a trusted brand for audiences open up to hundreds of artists where actually we don't have um, a say in sort of the work they're making or an insight into the sort of quality of that work. But actually, it's about providing that opportunity at that sort of key pivotal moment. And we went backwards and forwards, but fundamentally that the jump had to be, we have to be okay with a, not knowing a lot of information we'd normally want to ask because that information doesn't help us with selection. Uh, we have to be in the way that John said, we have to be a bit um, more brusque with the questions we ask. They, you know, we can no longer say, you know, express in your own words. We sort of need a yes or a no, because ultimately this is being filtered and, and taken, through, um, taken through a selection process. And we can't have, I mean, I think we've, you know, we had, you know, thousands and thousands of applicants we can't have nuance in every single application because actually what you need is a data pool that you can then sort very easily and you, you can make that selection from and we also just had to let go of quality and also the sort of artistic brand of the organization so ours is an ensemble companies theatre but actually a lot of solo work was made um, at Broadgate during that year a lot of work that is very far outside of our normal wheelhouse but you just had to go, well, actually, that's the gesture of this project. This is what we're wanting to do. And actually, there are things that are going to come with that that we've just got to, we've just got to get behind. Um, and those were the most challenging conversations internally to sort of overcome and sort of work out. But we, we got there in the end. Yeah, I, that's really fascinating. Thank you. Um, Jody. did you have any concerns around picking somehow lower quality applications through the random process? Um, I think because ours is an artist bursary opportunity and it's really about artist and personal development, that was kind of less of an issue for us. Um, and I think kind of touching on what Ash said earlier, it came really clear when we were kind of planning our processes that how do you apply a set of criteria to an individual's kind of personal development and you know what would you possibly be looking at would it be you know kind of how how do you judge how useful an opportunity is for somebody or how ready they are for it particularly if we can be responsive to those people so that because that felt really uncomfortable to try and kind of quantify and set, add a set of criteria to and what kind of what could we ask people to to respond to to lay a set of criteria to select from um, so that uh, that felt kind of really good in terms of random selection and, and I think just to circle back slightly to what you were saying earlier around um, if the randomness to throw up kind of new kind of new things. And I think that felt really exciting to our delivery team and our consortium to potentially be finding and um, discovering and meeting a lot of artists that we hadn't encountered before that were new to us and hadn't kind of been applying for our other programs as well. John, do you want to build on that? I know we had a similar sense of this funding is for new activity, new ideas. Yeah, I, I think I'm going to echo a lot of what's just been said, actually. But um, I think uh, when we have offered these kind of bursaries before, the, these are grants of up to £2,000. Uh, previously, we've run 
uh, around anniversaries for individuals that have been around the thousand pound mark. At certain points in the long listing, you realize you've got a pool of applicants in a, a previous process we've run with assessment. You've got a long list that is full of brimming with ideas and excitement. And you, you start to wonder, how do you ever get down to a selection based on like future potential? And I think random selection is a really useful tool in that kind of situation where you, you, you're working on little information about what, um, if, if the applicant's early career, they might not have a huge amount of track record. So you're selecting for potential, you're selecting based on ideas. And if you've got a large pool of perfectly great ideas and, um, you know, really exciting people, then perhaps random is the best way of um, making selection because you might be surprised by the outcomes. Um, you, you, in fact, you want to be open to those outcomes. You don't want to predetermine based on your, your taste or someone else's taste or, or subjectivity what, what that outcome might be. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, Ash and Laura, do you want to add anything further on this point or shall we move to the Q&A? We, we can move to the q and I I think what we would have is very similar. I think it's just maybe ours was just slightly different in that it was freelancer to freelancer rather than from an organisational perspective. So we we don't feel in a position to ever be able to really have a, a benchmark of, um, I don't know, like funding criteria. Um, we saw this, that, as I said earlier, this was kind of a response to what was happening at that time, um, financial wise, particularly for people who had lost everything. Um, so this was really intended to just be a bump or a little bit of a lifeline. Um, hopefully a luxury it would have been lovely if people could have spent it on a bit of a holiday and had some rest from the, the horrible time they'd been having but likelihood was they would use it to subsidize some of the unpaid labor they'd been doing throughout the pandemic so again it, it didn't the quality doesn't didn't come into it for for us in any way thank you so a couple of things that really shine through about why it worked what the pros were among some of the challenges, all of these projects really simplified the application process and reduced the labour on applicants. All of them had sort of tick box or just submit your CV, making it as user friendly as possible. All of them were for relatively speaking, smaller grants that were either to start something or completely without uh, any defined outcomes they were open and free to be spent as needed um, in David and in Horizon and NDT's case obviously on using space or going to Edinburgh so quite very specific consistent opportunities and offer and language that it is an offer that it it's not something that you're I think David used the word sort of asking artists to bleed onto the page for. These are these are opportunities that should be widely available anyway um, and, and just aren't, unfortunately. And, and so they're they're kind of they're freely given, they're high trust, and they come with as few restrictions as, as possible around them. Um, and that kind of generosity of spirit somehow that underpins why in that instance randomness is a useful tool I think feels like it's really coming through for me um, so we've got some really great questions coming through on the Q&A function thank you everybody and um, the first one is very specifically for Jody um, and I'm, I hope this is okay Jody I'm going to read it out it says Jody you said that if all successful applications had been selected were London based you'd have made more space to mix that up how would you have done that? Would you have had to deselect some chosen apps or would you have been able to offer more bursaries? Um, yeah, so I um, we, we had um, eight opportunities in total and we committed to at least half of those would be um, reserved for artists that were based outside of London. 
um, the way that we did this, and I spent a lot of time during the supper as a process beforehand, there's a very clear rationale to it. But essentially in those kind of two random lists that we created, the first two artists were um, automatically selected if they were both based in, based in London and the third person on that list was also based in London, we would then just skip through the list in numerical order, which felt a bit murky because obviously you're then kind of messing with the total random selection. Um, but I would say that this was kind of all laid out in advance and it was very clear at the point of application that we'd be doing that. So um, that felt kind of less difficult in terms of that, but it was also just such an important point for us that we weren't kind of, we wouldn't have everyone based in one part of England that we needed to kind of add that layer into the process. Thank you. And next question is from Lauren Hendry in from Feyre Roy. I'm probably mispronouncing that in the Highlands, apologies. Um, could tightly defining eligibility criteria risk marginalizing those working in more niche art forms, e.g. circus? I think this is a really interesting question because we talked about making sure to address structural inequalities and prioritizing bursaries and opportunities for certain demographic groups. But what about art form groups? Is there any risks there? Which is less eligibility perhaps or more, yes, yeah, sort of the focus or criteria of the fund, the focus of the opportunity. Does anyone want to offer some thoughts on that? John. Uh, I think it's a real issue with funding and opportunities altogether that um, uh, a funder or an organization puts out an opportunity and they've got a sense, um, rightly or wrongly, of what they want to support through it. So um, criteria by its definition does start to um, ex exclude right from the off. I don't think random has any more exclusionary power than any other opportunity, or even less in that um, someone, a, a, anyone who believes they meet the criteria can apply it and the, the rest is taken care of the, by the random selector. So I think what we were pleasantly surprised by in the one-to-one -one fund, it's the real breadth of practices, art forms, and geographic locations that came through in the selection. And there is a question of, would these applications made, made it through a, a different, more subjectively led process? I sat here, I don't know, but I, I think we celebrate the, the breadth of practices and locations and the um, backgrounds and identities of the artists being supported as a result of random selection. Thank you, John. Another question coming is, do you think random selection can only work on programmes aimed at early career artists? Of course, Ash and Laura used yours for both an early career segment and a mid-career segment. There's a connected question here, which is essentially saying, okay, the funders focus is on emerging artists, but only now application processes are being simplified, labor lessened, and potentially randomized to remove barriers to artists that are not so adept at translating their ambitions into application speak, or have not been in a position to invest unpaid time in applying. How can we support the forever emerging artists that have so far not managed to secure funding, the ones that did not manage to build a track record to be accepted as mid-career, but not for lack of trying? So I guess a question about that definition of early career. And I guess we're, it, it's a quite unusual mix of organizations on this call. I don't, I'm trying to think, we're not aware of any other funders or organizations that have focused on mid or later career that have used random tool as a tool, but there might be one out there. I, I wonder, is it is it just accidental that we're all relatively, focused on early career? I would say that quite a few mid-career companies came through the opportunities that we gave. I mean, we had companies like Belarus Free Theatre using quite a lot of the space. And, you know, I, I would say they're, they're quite far beyond um, early career. 
I think in terms of whether or not you could bring this to mid-career, it comes back to a conversation I don't think we've touched on yet, which is, you know, ultimately how artists feel about this random selection. And while for sort of small opportunities or small bits of resource or, or things that, that are help, but, you know, aren't absolutely, you know, big career game changers, I think random selection feels great. I think in our experience, talking to artists, as soon as it starts to become big substantial career progression opportunities it starts to become money that they need in order to sustain their practice artists transist from feeling like this is a transparent very low effort way of making sure that you know um that rejection things are handled with with well towards feeling actually i feel like my agency is being being taken away here i don't feel that i'm able to put um my case across i'm not able to sort of advocate for myself and I'm actually feeling, you know, very powerless uh, through through this application process. And, you know, that's been the feedback from artists we've had around, you know, their initial thoughts on, on sort of lottery and sort of randomization. So actually, when you get to the mid-career, um, and I suppose what you're asking for is, is a greater level of resource, you're asking for a greater level of funding, and you're, you're asking for something more substantial, I think there would start to become issues around the, the sort of well-being of artists to insist that everything is down to luck and everything is down to everything is down to randomization in my opinion anyway absolutely david um might be an opportunity just to ask the rest of the panel how did people respond to the random element um jody you're probably a bit early to get feedback from applicants ash and laura or oh, we've just got ash where's laura gone Still here. Oh yeah, <laughs> just disappeared. Um, I mean, for us, genuinely, when people were applying, when they were at the moment of applying, and when they got an email that was, for most people, sorry, you weren't like picked out of the generator. We got so many responses from people that were saying, "Well, like, thanks for doing this because this was like really low pressure. It's really refreshing." Um, it's easy, like, why can't everyone else do this? And obviously, like, that's what we're here about. But I think that it, it was so overwhelmingly, like, positive. And also, like, when we were emailing people saying, sorry, you, you didn't get picked out of the hat, but here's, like, some other things that you could look at signposting, people were responding like oh thank you for telling me <laughs> so there was still this layer of like actually people are so conditioned to be like writing applications putting them in maybe not even finding out until it goes out on social media or or, or whatever it is like these kind of bad practices not being offered feedback or or whatever it is that that people were grateful that there was something that was low effort that they were told that they didn't get it so that they could kind of just move on, but also the balance of that and like the energy, it was, it was the same. They didn't have to put too much energy in to apply. And if they didn't get it, it, it was a lottery. I've just seen one of the questions here as well. Like, I think for, for, for our specific, like way that we were doing it, um, the question says like the emotional challenge of like being unsuccessful, we, we didn't receive any feedback like that. I think because people went in knowing that it was random, if they didn't get it, it, it wasn't a competition. It wasn't, is my stuff good enough or not? That actually it was just like, okay, because they had done so little. I think if, if the amount of effort you have to put in is higher, then yes, maybe emotionally that's a, a, a different situation, but... I think we found that too in that being rejected randomly was certainly again it was less personal and but also it, conversely being selected randomly felt quite different perhaps as well um I'm going to pick on John because I know we did quite a significant applicant post application survey because we were really interested in how applicants had decide why they decided to apply knowing it was a random selection and what they felt about it yeah, so, so we asked some questions about two or three weeks after they made the application before the draw was known. So they weren't instead of knowing what the outcome was, they were just kind of, we were keen just to have more neutral response to, is it a good idea or not? 
um, we asked how many people knew that um, random was going to be the method by which the selection was going to be made. To be, um, you know, clear on how, how many people entered it kind of eyes wide open, 95% knew that they were, that's what they were in for with this. Um, we were very attuned to kind of negative responses to random selection. We thought that it might go down quite badly. For, <laughs> I think that was just our kind of nervousness around this very new process. Actually, 54% of um, applicants viewed it positively or very positively. Only 19% were had a negative view of random selection. But what we found is that the negative views were more vocal about why they thought it wasn't a good idea. And they came down to reasons of um, they really wanted to put their work in front of people that would recognize it and help promote and um, uh, value it. And even if they weren't successful, that kind of um, that that portfolio view kind of felt really important in terms of opportunities and funding and not getting that feedback felt quite problematic. Another, um, and we, we've got kind of contextual writing on this, which I'd urge people to read, but another more negative view of it was that it's um, really about the state of the arts that inequality is baked into who gets opportunities or not. And it's the, are the arts really ready for a purely equal way of selecting it. And there was some sense from some quarters that actually this was a, ahead of its time by several years and there was still a lot to do around kind, kind of positive action and really looking at representation of who gets what in terms of opportunity making. So there might be that this is a, a, a an approach that is fit for things once we've done a whole load of other work around um, representation in the arts. Thank you, John. I'm smiling there because there's a, a great question. Uh, did you randomly select applicants to give feedback on the process or did you ask everyone? Um, we did ask everyone. Uh, I think around 40% um, of applicants fed back. So uh, given the high numbers of individuals is 1,700 and something, individuals in the 800 and something pairs. Uh, that was quite a, a, a high number of, uh, of voices that we were able to get feedback on. I think what surprised us most is that in between those who thought it wasn't that great and the 54% who thought it was really great or great was a really big chunk of about a third who really didn't care either way. And it really helped us stay humble and alive to the fact that nerdy as we might be about the different ways of all of them flawed, distributing money and opportunities. Um, at the end of the day, it's just, we've just got to get it out there. <laughs> like, and um, and uh, it, it's, that's the main thing really. Um, so we're running out of time uh, and I would love to finish with this question, which is, do you plan to use it again? Oh no, there's one other one, which is about, is there a conversation to be had with ACE? which I don't think uh, we can have time to answer, but I think is a really interesting question uh, because there is, there is something in here of a tool that I think in certain circumstances, as we've highlighted, could be quite a useful aid for bigger funders um, than we all are. Anyway, do you plan to use it again? Ash and Laura. Um. <clears throat> I mean, it depends whether anybody ever gives us any money to distribute ever again. So we're kind of reliant on entering into the funding pro application process in order to get money to give money. So we'll see whether that happens again. Um, but I mean, yes, fundamentally, our belief is that all, all, question mark, application processes are in inaccessible. Um, lots of people get stuck at emerging because they never get support for exactly that reason and comes back to kind of what uh, someone was asking about earlier. Um, I think that this is, again, there are probably many flaws to this method, but I think it is a way of, of experimenting with the gatekeeping and with the uh, criteria and with the I'm very good at form filling in um, 
culture that we have in the arts. Um, so I, I think we would use it again. Thank you. David. Um, it's been really great for this sort of project. It's really like horses for courses though, with the sort of processes that you take. I think if we were in a similar situation where we had um, a, a large amount of resource to give out and we were looking to do something that was sort of across the entire sector, I think, yeah, we would absolutely consider consider looking at lottery. But I think the the emotion and the the, the sort of gesture of, of what we're inviting artists to be a part of needs to match the application process and the selection process. So it would really depend on, on what that form was as to whether we would choose to go with, with random selection again. But there's nothing that's come up that would discourage us from doing it for this sort of opportunity. All about matching what the offer is with the process. Thank you. Um, Jody. too soon to tell? Perhaps. Um, I think we probably, as you have, want to do a full evaluation and speak to the participants and see how the project as a whole went. Um, there's obviously, there are plans at the moment to run a similar programme next year. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess it would be to, I don't, um, duly kind of evaluate the program and what that is next year if it's exactly the same offer or if it's slightly different and also speak to participants and how that went for them but at the moment there's no reason why you know we wouldn't we wouldn't go through a similar process great so yeah watch this space for next year's horizon showcase finally john um i think as this conversation shows and um the evaluation that we've put out today uh, demonstrates, uh, I think Gerald Arts re remains really interested in random selection as a potential tool, useful tool for um, making fairer, more transparent uh, funding available to, to artists. So I, I think as David was saying, the right tool for the right process is really important. So it's, it's just whether we, we come up with the, the right framework for it again in the future. But it, it, I think this um, conversation and the thinking we've done about it has, has meant that um, I, th I think we're very aware of both the upsides and downsides and where it can be used effectively. Yes. So yes, nothing concrete yet, but watch this space at Jerwood Arts. Right. I think despite valiant attempts in the uh, Q&A. Thank you very much to David in particular for, for putting as many answers in there as possible. Um, I know we've not covered everybody's questions. Feel free to email us, um, merka at gerwardarts.org or info at gerwardarts.org if there's something um, you're keen to follow up with us on. As John says, we're really interested um, in these conversations. And we have published for the first time really uh, for the one-to-one -one fund from the very start why we decided to run the fund the thinking behind it what happened at each stage um, and now pulled that all of that together in the evaluation that we published this morning um so yeah first my thanks to jenny and sandy a valiant effort some very fast speaking speakers thank you very much um, and huge thanks to Jody, David, Laura, Ash, John, and behind the scenes, Merka and Kaya uh, for making it all run so smoothly. That's all, folks. Thank you very Thanks much. Everyone. Bye. Thank you.